Uh, thank you very much indeed, Nola. Um, and it's great to see so many people here discussing these issues, uh, such profound issues today, because um, I'm bewildered why these bunch of issues aren't centre stage in the public conversation, given the scale of the challenges that we must confront over the next few years. And what really brought it home to me as a local MP, I was just talking about it with Dave and Nola before I got up here, was a few years ago I went to a Tesco's distribution centre, massive Tesco's distribution centre in my constituency, and they were very reluctant to let me in. And I could see why straight away when I eventually managed to get in. There's a big strike on there at the moment because of some of these issues. And um, it was the first time I'd physically seen people with technology locked onto them in this distribution warehouse. And they had become uh, sort of elements of this dehumanised sort of workplace where people were just appendages to this technology. We used to have the old time and motion man, you know, that, that sort of approach to sort of regulating work. And this had reached levels that I had never physically witnessed in my uh, life before. And it has profound issues in terms of how you represent people, how you try and confront this, and how you broach the public conversation around it. I've just sat for a year or so on the Labour Party, set up a commission on the future of work, um, which published a report, which is worth having a look in some of these debates. But it was most frustrating is that it became quite a te technical conversation about the statistics and the projections for the future demand for labour and work, rather than a first principle conversation about the lives we live, the nature of the work we do, what gives us dignity in our lives, which I think should be the base camp for any conversation around this area. And that's basically what I want to touch on today. Um, because my argument is a pretty simple one, actually. Um, in terms of this conversation, I think we need to take a step back and focus on the fundamental ethical questions that this period of epochal technological transformation throws up, rather than simply jumping straight into the technical questions that tend to dominate what is the present conversation. Now, I'll start with a simple, honest admission. As an MP, I often feel that the many challenges facing the country almost feel inversely proportionate to the capacity of us politicians and policymakers to even properly discuss them, let alone resolve them. There's almost an inverse relationship to the scale of the challenges we face and the way we shrink the conversations in terms of what we deem important. They're almost too big to confront. And that, I think, dominates this sort of conversation. This is not a trite point. A simple hit at what is often called the technocracy, the political law policy elites. It speaks to a more general ability or not for liberal democracies to navigate the complexities of the modern world. I'll give you a couple of examples which are not directly relevant, supposedly, to this conversation, but I think they are. One obvious example, in the face of escalating authoritarianism across Europe and the globe, where is the systematic political diagnosis and response to these phenomena? Um, similarly, where is the actual defence of liberal democracy? Because that seems to be what's at stake. Um, or take another example, in our post-referendum world, do we really talk about the issues and feelings that ushered in this referendum result rather than appear preoccupied with the discussion of the technical aspects of Brexit? Um, do we persist in ignoring what lies underneath and what does this mean in the future? I raise these points for a simple reason. I would argue that this form of disconnect basically arises because politics long ago lost its ethical grip or capacity to advance beyond technocratic administration. And arguably, today's populist uprisings reflect a backlash against this managerialism that is awash in the political environment. Arguably, we need to retrieve a public conversation that requires very different foundations. One that addresses moral and cultural questions regarding the lives we wish to live as people and how the current disparity between that ideal and reality can find painful and often angry political expression through forms of resentment and humiliation. Um, I begin with this point because any serious conversation of the issues being covered today cannot, it seems to me, be separated from the epochal challenge that we as a society face. I would suggest that these might include, amongst others, a lack of genuine inclusive growth and escalating inequality, the era of fake news that challenges the character of the public conversation itself, indeed a, an authoritarianism that challenges democracy, 
attempts to intervene and undermine our national elections, domestic extremism of various forms and escalating, and the corrosion of international rules-based systems. In a period of bewildering change, this has to be the context, it seems to me, within which we should approach today's discussion, although this isn't the way we tend to approach this conversation. Um, and these sort of arguments I just made appear unrelated to questions of robotics and artificial intelligence, where I think they are absolutely fundamentally linked to them. And I would argue it is imperative that we embed all our discussion of these technological changes within this deeper conversation that we need to have. More specifically, in terms of today's conference, whether the forecasts are apocalyptic or utopian, no one doubts the significance of artificial intelligence. It has the potential to affect all policy fields, from education to the labour market, from policing to healthcare and social care, as has been discussed before lunch. Um, but I would argue current political thinking around AI is reactive and simply geared towards ensuring Britain is at the forefront of technological progress. Now, on one level, that's totally understandable. Um, a utilitarian approach to technological change, we might describe it as. Um, a government approaches this in terms of how we might maximise the benefits for the maximum amount of people, the maximum amount of its citizens. It's the sort of hallmark of the technocratic, managerial, utilitarian approach to governance. Um, but maybe we should just take a step back. Maybe we should begin by discussing what role technology should and should not play in our societies, our workplaces, and our personal lives. These are not simply questions of utility, although they are tended to be framed that way. They require a conversation anchored around a deeper one regarding modern, modern ethical questions regarding the lives we live and the society might, we might lift, wish to live in. Without asking these fundamental questions, politics is likely to be back foot and reactive vis-a-vis -vis technology and public policy becomes jumbled and somewhat randomised. You could actually extend this argument, I'd suggest. This shrinkage of the terms of public debate down to technical rather than ethical questions is doubly problematic, as there is a further challenge for politicians and policymakers with regard to artificial intelligence owing to their and our lack of technical and scientific expertise in these areas. For example, being unable to evaluate the claims of developers or to independently discuss discern the likely outcomes and risks of their products means that both politicians and public are prone to be swayed by either the apocalyptic, sorry, I always struggle with that word, and uh, techno-utopian narratives. Relying on technologists to give an account of what their software can do or might lead to is especially problematic given the ideological background which gives shape to certain elements within the tech sector. For example, many have brought into what is described as techno-solutionism, the idea that all problems which humanity face can be solved using technology, including those problems which technology itself creates. For many in Silicon Valley, this confidence in the potential of technology goes hand in hand with forms of libertarianism as the role of technology, and hence their profit margins, expands so should the role of the state, they believe, contract. <coughs> I.e., it is highly political in terms of the role of the state and interventions in the market. Then there are those who approach these issues from a transhumanist background. Modern transhumanism asserts that technological change creates the opportunity tra to transcend the human condition of becoming transhuman, and crucially, this is to be celebrated. Resistance is deemed parochial, nostalgic, Luddite. Now, what happens when transhumanist thinking informs the technologists themselves? I'll give you an example. Nick Bostrom is both director of H+, an international transhumanist organisation, and the Future of Life Institute at Oxford University, which regularly produces policy recommendations for government. So there's a desperate need for policymakers to avoid being captivated by the promise of technological progress 
without an appreciation of the philosophical assumptions that might inform this thinking and engage critically with new arguments in this field. It seems to me this is applicable both to libertarian politics on the right, but also on the radical left. Some of the most fashionable thinking on the radical left, which is mainstreamed into the center of left-wing debate nowadays, has embraced transhumanist thinking and pushed for, amongst other things, what they describe as cyborg augmentations, artificial life, synthetic biology, synthetic freedom, and technologically mediated reproduction. They are quotes of what should be nurtured in the public domain. Consequently, even philosophers like Jürgen Habermas, who argues that we should retain a species ethic when we're working our way through this technology, are deemed nostalgic, reactionary, Luddites. Parochial is the term that's usually used. Backward-looking, reactionary, conservative, hostile to progress. These are all loaded terms which are bowled into play regularly in terms to neutralize those who are, are seeking to assert, quote, a species ethic into this debate. On a more specific level, the potential risks of mismanaging artificial intelligence are indeed phenomenal. Take a couple of examples, and I know ones that you've been discussing today. Estimates of the proportion of jobs in the UK that could be replaced by AI and related technologies range broadly from about 22%, as far as I can see the literature, to about 40% over the next couple of decades. A wide range of estimates of future structural unemployment exist, which would point to a whole range of policy remedies in play from modern full employment to early retirement to universal income, which might be in conflict with each other. And all of this depends, arguably, on the futurology that you listen to rather than the data that you analyse, because the futurology tends to drown out, actually, the data and what we genuinely do know about what's happening. And that goes back to the point about the loaded conversation that is developing in terms of who is defining the terms of this conversation. And that is why this is such an antidote, this conversation today. Take another example. We've already seen data analytics malignly being used in targeted political campaigns. And this could become even more sophisticated at the expense of our democratic process itself. We see what the Mueller inquiry is doing in terms of the involvement of collusion with the <coughs> Russians and the intervention in North American elections. There are arguments about the Brexit debate, but um, even more potent, with facial recognition software now being trialled for the purposes of marketing to detect the eff efficacy of an advert on the viewer by judging their facial expressions, businesses have the potential to reach into people's lives in a way George Orwell's 1984 imagined for a totalitarian government. Similarly, we've already seen the effects of the filter bubble effect on civic and social life Social media is increasingly feeding us information which aligns with our preconceived notions of the world and closing off any contradictory information, thereby limiting our action, creating divisions in society. No transcendent conversation is being nurtured to pull people together rather than reinforce these canyons down the country. A friend of mine said to me this week, and I thought it was really interesting. She said, um, she was talking about her children. She said, I wonder when my children grow up, um, what will they think about me allowing them access to so much technology? They might well come back to me in the future and why did I allow them to be abused by this technology? And I thought it was a really interesting question about trying to think through where we might be in a few years and our duties and responsibilities today in creating boundaries around the all embracing forms of technological change. All of this is likely to be exaggerated by further developments in artificial intelligence and the ramifications for social cohesion could literally be catastrophic. Public debate could also suffer from the ease with which fake news could be produced on an industrial scale given that AI makes the processing and manipulating of all forms of digital data substantially easier and cheaper. Our very knowledge of the world around us and notions of truth are at stake in this conversation. That seems to me to be the fundamental point. The notion of objective truth and knowledge could be the collateral in this conversation if we get it wrong. Now, this 
obviously appears somewhat melodramatic, but I don't think it is. Um, that's why today's conversation is so vital. Posing the greatest threat to the established political parties, however, could fr come from the feelings of powerlessness and exclusion felt by many as they feel that decisions about them, from hiring to policing to insurance, are made by machines. In the House of Lords report on artificial intelligence, they said this, the most challenging point, and I quote, the most challenging point relating to AI and democracy is the lack of choice which is offered to the population at large about the adoption of technology. It is, to say the least, undemocratic. Populists are sure to benefit of jo as jobs in blue collar and clerical work are hit first, allowing the people, my constituents, truck drivers, call center operators, factory operatives, to be pitted against the elite software designers, developers, venture capitalists and the like. As wealth becomes increasingly concentrated in the hands of businesses who employ fewer and fewer humans, our society will be riven by equality, inequality on a scale perhaps never before seen. The potential effects of AI are thus on a scale against which even Brexit pales by comparison. Yet as it stands, the policy proposals to meet these challenges are phenomenally weak. Most of them are excruciatingly individualistic. Recommendations, for example, that developers undergo training in ethics as part of their computer science degrees, that companies ensure their workforces are diverse and that individuals made redundant, perhaps repeatedly by AI, are unable to train for a new career. These are necessarily sticking plasters, but they are far from sufficient. Broader in scale, universal basic income is one proposal floated to ensure that those who lose their jobs are not made destitute. Usually pushed by the same people who are destroying those jobs. Yet this could mean the state taking on a phenomenal welfare burden, almost a form of industrialised welfare, at a time when fewer people are able to pay any tax at all. So, to make up for this perceived deficit, it's then proposed that government budgets are supplemented by a robot tax. But this too is problematic. Would we tax algorithms as well as robots? What about vending machines? Trying to define a robot would be a legal and regulatory nightmare. It seems to me all of the leading technologists are offloading a lot of these fiscal concerns or democratic concerns. Um, to cover themselves with certain remedies that allow them to get out from under their deeper responsibility stroke culpability in terms of the world tilting through these technological changes. It also runs the risk of companies which wish to use robots moving to countries without such a robot tax. To be effective, we would need all countries to agree on enforcing such a levy. As the contradictory directions of these two proposals show, when policy is solely reactive, bending to suit the technologists' goals, it becomes incoherent. Before we make good policies, then, we need to return to first principles, asking questions about the values we place on work, freedom, privacy, community, and a deeper conception of justice. In short, about what type of society we want to build. From there, we can discern the role we wish to allocate to technology rather than it being seduced by the hype of novelty and processing power. We can then decide from first principles the ethical environment and responsibilities of the technologists and their platforms. I would argue that we should remember that just because a technologist devises a solution, that does not mean we have to agree with them on their definition of a problem. Here's the shock we might find the need they may have been most keen to address was in reality their own profit margins. Call me old fashioned, but I still subscribe to a view, almost an ancient view to democracy, that is the role of politicians in collaboration with the public and not Silicon Valley to identify and remedy problems in society. If we do not build policy upon a well-defined vision of human flourishing, Policymakers run the risk of slipping into techno solutionism, thereby putting technological and economic progress above people, leaving them to become citizens of corporations, in effect. 
or we may endorse a soft technological determinism in using policy only to manage what are euphemistically termed risks, when what in reality is at stake are huge social issues, rising inequality, the accumulation of power in the hands of private corporations and a few individuals, and the fundamental question of human dignity in the modern world. Policy do needs to be more than a technocratic exercise in risk management, and that's arguably what it has now become. In short, our political conversation needs to change. Basically, utilitarians should move over a bit, and we should return to those deeper conversations about what constitutes a good life, what is a fulfilling life to live, and what constitutes a good society with which to nurture and build. Those should be the terms of the debate, rather than collapsing the conversation into technocratic technocratic concerns about managing risk and maximizing utility. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>